Well, good morning. I'm here with Keith Cornelius from Blast One. How are you, Keith? I'm doing great. Thanks, Justin. How are you? Good. Thank you for organizing to talk to us. So, so this conversation is a little unusual. Normally, we talk about sales and sales improvement. And you guys have a story to tell there. But I think this morning, we want to focus on customer service and what you've achieved. So my first question, Keith, is, is in a nutshell, what have you achieved? So what we've achieved is we've completely turned upside down our customer service department from, an or from a department that was keeping track on notebooks, logging calls coming in in Salesforce, but really not having any vision into what was happening. All we were doing is looking at a 30,000 30, foot view and mm. if issues would come up, we would be scaling through notebooks from two weeks ago or anything like that. And what does and it look like now? What it looks like now, I mean, it, it's amazing because I, I think back to before and it, it makes my head hurt. Now, what we have is a whole system that is documented in detail around every action coming into customer service. Okay. Now, we're going to come back and dig into that. So, I, uh, so just give me the numbers. What have you achieved numerically? And then we'll come back and talk about, uh, you, you know, what's happened behind the scenes to achieve that. Okay. So, numerically, if you just look at the activities coming in, um, you know, what we gold the team out at is, is to achieve 90% of tickets that are coming in to be completed on time. So each ticket type has a time associated to it. Um, and we've scaled it up to an average of 93.9% uh, .9 to date. Uh, we've, we've jumped that up from about six weeks ago even to um, oh, about 10%. Um, but I think from a numbers standpoint, uh, we've, we were able to increase our customer service uh, personnel. We've got four people in there. We went from two to four. Um, so you've increased the velocity. You've increased the velocity of tickets by 10 points, which is, um, which is exciting. And has that been at the expense of quality? It's not. So I guess that's, that's the biggest point of this whole process is that We've, we've advanced the, the velocity, as you say, of the tickets. But what we've been doing, too, is we've been meeting. So each week when I meet with the customer service folks, we review their tickets from last week to ensure that we didn't lose the quality and we weren't just, just focusing on a number. So we look individually at each ticket, make sure the details are in there. Um, and with that, we've seen you know our errors obviously drastically reduce. Um, but we're So there's evidence that quality has gone up. Absolutely, 100%. So velocity's gone up, quality's gone up, and what are the, uh, are there broader implications for the business other than a better looking dashboard? The, the best implication for the business is that when problems occur, because problems in business happen, right? When problems happen, we can jump on them immediately and we can resolve them so much faster because of the details that are in a ticket. Um, we now have the ability to go through and, and solve problems so much faster. Um, but we also have the ability to help customers in a much faster way because we're getting all the details in. So we've gotten rid of notebooks. So we're mm. not sitting here going like this, answering the phone and going back and forth. If headsets, we're typing all the information is going into Salesforce one time. Yeah. And we're able to go back and forth and make sure that so do you think the work that you're doing is, is going to help Blast One grow? Now, I know you're going to say yes, and I think any reasonable person would say yes, but are you seeing any evidence yet that would support the fairly obvious belief that what you've achieved is going to help Blast One grow? Absolutely. Um, you know, this past summer, we've had like three or four record months. Um, I, I won't attribute it all to customer service, but um, our the workload coming in, we're able to do more of. Terrific. Just from this. So that's great news. But of course, the, uh, the story is in how you got here. So let's wind back to the beginning. So I think we met when I, re when I ran a solution design workshop with you guys in Columbus. Is that right? Uh, so Blas One has two locations, the US and um, and Australia, you started in Australia and expanded to the US. You're based in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Um, and can you tell our viewers what Blast One does? So what we do is we, we're in business to change the lives of people that are blasting, that are business owners, 
to make it safer, um, to make it more efficient, and ultimately impact the global corrosion industry and be the, 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 the most trusted supplier and resource for those companies that exist around corrosion. So the types of things that you supply to blasters are? Sandblast equipment, abrasive, um, safety equipment, um, air dryers, there's a long list. Everything having to do with um, somebody that would be preparing a surface to paint. Um, from that point on to uh, the paint that goes onto that surface and how to make sure that it's, it's curing the right way and making sure that it'll last for a long time. We're talking about the infrastructure of the world. You know, okay. Tanks, refinery. So from abrasive all the way up to capital equipment, and, and you, exactly. actually, you actually custom build blast rooms too? We do. We custom build blast rooms, absolutely. Blast rooms, spray booths, um, anything and everything having to do with coatings, uh, we're involved. Excellent. Well, I'd, I'd love to see, for obvious reasons, organizations come from Australia and do well in the, in the US. So um, that's awesome. So talk to, when, when we ran that initial solution design workshop, most of our focus was on sales, but we talked about customer service, and I'm sure I stressed, stressed because I do always, that we have to make sure that we have a robust customer service team with plenty of capacity, plenty of capability before we do anything with sales. Uh, and, we, and I talked about, I ticked off, I'm sure, a, a, a list of the things that we would need to do, almost hygiene factors that we would need to have in place in order for us to be able to say we have a robust customer service function. What were those hygiene factors? Um, I mean, efficiency was the biggest thing. Is that we're not we're not having notebooks anymore. We're yeah. putting all the information. No more notebooks. <laughs> no more notebooks. That was a big that was a big thing. Yeah. Um, and and Alina was here a lot, joking about it, and that she was going to burn our notebooks. You know, yeah. That kind of thing. Um, but notebooks. Well, if you hadn't got rid, got rid of them, she would have. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle of the office. So no more notebooks was one was one of the factors. The other one was yeah. headsets. Headsets, yeah, and we already had headsets and we already had dual monitors. Um, you know, the dual monitor thing is is a key portion to yeah. it because you're able to see a lot more information in front of you. Um, but the other hygiene was that um, the outside guys would be bringing all the information and all the workflow into customer service. So you you take it out of their hands and you put it into customer service. Yeah. Because of the people that there. So the first thing was the hygiene thing. We wanted we wanted all the operators wearing headsets at all times. We wanted to get rid of notebooks. We wanted to do all work in the computer, which means creating a case for everything and creating activities against cases. Uh, and then the next part was we wanted to, we probably had a broader definition of customer service and we wanted to route a whole bunch of additional work to customer service. Can you explain what the plan was there? Yes, yeah, so what we did is, um, you're, you're asking in terms of the, the additional workload on customer service, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so customer service coming into it was essentially a two to, well, two man team that was quoting, uh, they were placing orders, they were inside selling, they were doing everything. And what we designed with your help was um, that we would divide the labor out. Um, so rather than Having customer service do all of those tasks, we would assign it to a quoting person. We would assign the logistics to a logistical person. Um, we would assign purchasing tasks to a purchasing person. Um, so we would essentially leave customer service to be 100% reactive to what was coming in and essentially tasking activities out of cases or tickets as we call them. Um, yeah, so before, before us, I think you were done. trying to have customer service perform outbound calls. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, we got so we got rid of that. We said we'll move we'll move outbound calls to an inside sales team, but then we applied division of labor within customer service. Correct. Yep. Which was which was a bit of a, a struggle because we have people that have been doing something a certain way, mm. you know, for not a long time, but in control of the process. So we had to we had to make sure that that process was working. So they, they trusted it and would continue to use it. Yeah. The, you know, so I want to come back to you and talk to you about the structure. But before I do that, tell, tell, tell me about the reaction of the team members 
when when we ticked off that list of changes that we wanted to make, you know, no no notebooks and headsets and data entry and Salesforce well, and so on. The initial reaction was this is this is too much work. Mm. Sorry, my screen just went blank. Um, this this is more work. How are we being more efficient? Mm. That was the initial reaction. Um, you know, we're typing all the information in there. You know, why can't I just put it in my notebook? I can't I just do these things myself. I know I can get them done. And you know, so there was that there was that struggle of understanding that okay, if we if we don't divide the labor up, we'll never be able to scale to what we want to be. You know, this is okay right now; it's work. But um, I think it really you really had to have a, a team leader or someone inside of your group that grasped on. Maybe not initially, but you could sit with and say, okay, this is what we're doing. We need to be a leader. You know, the unspoken yeah. leader. So how did we? Um, how did you convince the team members to actually give it a go? Um, well, how I convinced them was just doing it over and over and over and over again. So we would talk about it. We'd talk about it. No, this is the way it needs to be because of this. And eventually what happened was is that they started seeing the benefits of it. So it was just a, it was a repetitive thing because okay. it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, a happy thing for them to do. So um, you, didn't make it, you didn't make it optional? No, didn't make it optional. And the other thing was is that we... One of the things that I did was I was really involved in the process. So I myself was actually doing tickets with them at this time. So we were we were doing this together. We were learning together. We were making sure the process was being followed. But I didn't um, I didn't stop once or twice to say no. We're not going to change things. I was open to ideas and how to make the system work around this better. And yeah. that's when we really grasped hold of Salesforce and we did some custom development um, with the ballistics mindset. Which I think really brought everyone together, um, and we and eventually, you know, after probably a month, month and a half of us getting together with it, people started recording tickets versus calls. You know, what I mean, is there really, a is there a tipping point? Do you feel where all of a sudden uh, this this the there was kind of consensus that the new way is better? Is there a particular point in time where you feel like the mood changed? have to think back. I mean, for me, the mood changing was when the, when, when there were problems. Mm. And what I mean by that is that it's there's nothing like having an issue and not being able to solve it quickly for a customer. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you have a notebook in someone's drawer on the other side of the room and it's fifth back, you know, and you've got to scale through that, that takes a lot of time. And that takes you know, you're taking time away from customers you could be helping at that moment. You're taking time away from the other person that could be helping someone at that moment because mm. they have, you have no idea how they'd file. And I think the moment that we started solving problems because of the details that were in the tickets, that's when it started clicking for folks. And they started realizing that, aha, okay, this is, this is great. This is awesome because mm. all my information is in there to help the customer and get it mm. done faster. Great. So how many people in the team in total? We have four people um, on the customer service. We have one quarter. We have one logistics person. We have a purchasing person. So there's seven. Um, so you've got seven frontline. Sorry, you've got seven seven operators four. in the area, but of them, four of them are frontline. Four frontline. Then we have three in the background. Four, so four frontline, three second line, or three specialists. Yeah. Well, I guess you'd call it three slash four if you get into technical folks, which we have someone in our in our blast fab or production environment that handles technical calls. Yeah, so that's a reasonable sized team. Do you know how many calls a day they're handling in total? Um, right now, what you're looking at is between 50 on a slow day, upwards of 70 um, to even 75 on a, on a big day. That's each or in total? In total. Yeah, I thought, I thought so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, what did I want to ask about? Oh, yes, I know what I want to ask about. Tell us about WIP meetings. Uh, what, what are they? What's the significance of them? How do they run? So why do, let's with start with what are they and why do we do them? Okay, the WIP meetings is more of a sync. It's a daily sync of what's going on, who's got what tickets. Um, and it's essentially you're, you're, you're going through the team and you're, you're seeing what they have on their plate. Um, and for us, what we do is we do highlights and top tasks and then stucks. 
it's the Rockefeller that we've molded into the whip of the tickets. Okay, um, but essentially, it's your time in the morning to actually get together with your team and make sure everything is ticking the way it should. Um, what we've found by doing it consistently is that we have problems. Um, if there's an issue with you know something in operations, that, you know someone's bringing it up. They're saying, "Hey, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck on this." How we do this, we see a black ticket or black case, right? We see this black color code in there. So black means? Black means it's it's over the limit. Yeah. You, you've, you've reached your maximum. Now it's going into the negative zone of, of the land we don't want to be in. Yeah, so red is, red is close to being due and black is overdue. Yep. Okay. Yep, green is good. And green we don't even talk about yep. the whips. Yellows we don't even talk about the whips. The only reds that we talk about... Are the ones that are really nearing that, that point of, of yeah. being uh, massive. So, so it's, every, it's once a day or twice a day? We do it once a day. Okay, first we thing in the morning? First thing, well, yeah, first thing when everyone's here because we have two different shifts. Yeah, and, and how long does the whip meeting typically, typically run for? 10 to 15 minutes. It can get into some conversations that go into 20. Yeah, but that's the max. Yeah. Um, how. how uh, um, what's the attitude of the team towards the daily whip? Um, you want to go in the beginning or after? Or now? Yeah, give me before and after. I'm sh I'm it's sure it's changed. changed. In the beginning, it's like, why are we doing this? You know, why why are we doing this? I know my stuff. I'm going through it. Um, and then the moment that we didn't, you know, because there were a couple of times, say, you know, you got a meeting or something like that, and it didn't happen. And then at the end of the day, you realize that this ticket that, that was black in the morning is still black, and you're going back to it and going, whoa, 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 whoa what happened? You know, it's, again, the, the importance of, of syncing with the team, understanding the tasks, and then shedding it, right? Spreading yeah. out the, uh, uh, the tasks amongst the team. But now it's like, now if, I, if it's, we do it at 909 is when we do it. Wow. If it's 9, I'm getting people tapping on my back, hey. Hey, that's cool. Why 909, Keith? Um, we do it, it's 909 is because um, there's been studies done that say that if a meeting starts at an odd time, people are more likely to show up on time. Um, and, it, and it works. We do it with all of our meetings here at, at Blast One. With the management meetings, it starts at uh, 751, um, 752. Um, and it's just something we started doing. I like it. It, it kind of telegraphs a, a, a level of precision. Uh, ten o'clock means sometimes around sometime around ten, but ten o two or ten o four yeah. makes it sound like you mean business. I like it. Uh, plus, you have those four minutes to make a coffee. That's right. See. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, are you at the point yet where uh, the team, if they were left to their own devices without you guiding them? would maintain as opposed to reverting back to to what they have previously? Yes, 100%. So even if you were off sick, they, they, they would find a stand-in to run the daily whip and things would continue? Yes. Yep, it happens consistently, absolutely. Hmm. There's no question. In the beginning it was like, hey, should we do it? Should we not do it? But now it's it doesn't matter. If I'm Because on Fridays I, I have a, um, an HOD meeting and hmm. I'm actually not a part of the whips then. Uh, they do it, and they go over tickets, and they, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat to see. They take ownership amongst themselves. Excellent. So let me just dig into reporting a little bit. You, you have a report that gives you a log of all of the open jobs and probably recently closed jobs, and you can sort it by on-time performance, and we've told the viewers how uh, they're color-coded. Black means late. Um, now, how have you calculated the default lead times for each of the task types? So what, what happened was is um, Alina and Brad and I got together and we, we looked at the types and we said, okay, when, when should this be complete? Um, and we, we defined each one that way. So we said for an order, eight hours, for a quote, four hours, for a problem, two hours. Um, you know, we just went down the line and associated each one of those ticket types with expectation from management. Yeah. And are you comfortable now that you've got it working and now that you're actually keeping an eye on the numbers, are you comfortable with that those, that those lead times are in line with customers' expectations? 
Yes, and then we've actually we've actually adjusted a few of them. Mm. Um, one being the order is down; it's going to go down to four hours, um, and we've also added a few other types in there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I think it's working fine. Um, so, how do you handle the queuing problem? So. One thing that's a perennial problem when we're working with customer service teams, and there are a number of ways of handling it, but the, the issue is that a good percentage of cases, particularly orders and RFQs, will land in individuals' inboxes. And of course, we need to, for reporting purposes, start the clock at the point at which they land, not the point at which they get attended to. How do you guys handle that? So what we do is we actually, so we have, we have an, um, an email that is a sales at blast-one.com, mm. which goes into our ticket queue. It feeds automatically into it. And I can't say that we're 100% around that problem, but the team, we've, we've pretty much made it a policy that, you know, if, if you get an email in from a customer and it's not to sales, but it's directly to Keith Cornelius, then I'm going to forward that to sales the moment that I get it. So that way it starts ticking on it. Uh -huh. And you record the time, you capture the time that it lands in the sales at Blast One inbox. Correct, correct. Because then that time is in Salesforce. Automatically creates a pretty date and time for that ticket in our queue. Uh, that's how it works. I see. So any, any email that lands in that queue auto generates a case. And yeah, then so the time. emails that are responses to existing cases, you just delete them out. Can you say that one more time? So if. So what I'm hearing is every email that lands in that queue results in a case being auto-generated in Salesforce. I'm guessing then if somebody, if it was just a response to a, to a pre-existing case, you would just delete that new case out. Correct. Um, what, if it was a response, what we would do is we actually have Salesforce or Outlook for Salesforce, which is a really nifty tool that actually mm. it analyzes all the emails coming into Outlook and to select this little mailbox item next to that person's name, and I can upload it. When I, when I select that person's name, it comes with a drop down of open activities, mm. and I can actually select the ticket that I want it to go to. Uh -huh. and I can just pop it in there. Or, in your case, Justin, if, if we have it a lot where, where people will, will, will reply all to sales, yeah. and if it's a random email or a, a spam email or something like that, we do delete those out. Okay. Excellent. So um, let's talk about the implications for the business as a whole. Um, um, I, I think that even before we got there, there was a lot more executive interest in customer service than there might be in other organizations that we work with. But what are your feelings about the contribution that your team is making to the to the to the growth and, and ultimately the profitability of Blast One moving forward. Uh, I mean, I think I think customer service is vital, and I and I, I joke and, and I'm serious about it uh, with my team and with the rest of the organization that they are the most important department in this organization. Um, everything coming in in terms of orders, quotes, anything needed for a customer comes to that department, and that's why it's so vital and so important that we have a grasp as to what's going on. Um, and it's you know, without that department, without this focus on customer service, then we would we wouldn't be able to scale to the goals that we have for the company. And I think that's that's very very much recognized, and I'm very fortunate to have that recognition from the executives of this company. Yeah. Because they they're involved in it every day. I mean, they look at tickets, they look at MPS boards that we send out to customers, and it's, it's a pretty powerful process that we have. Yeah, so from my perspective, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, my general expectation is that, that, we would see, that we would like to see two types of benefits, and I'm going to ask you, uh, ca can you relate any evidence of these two benefits? So the first one that we're interested in, obviously, is that if we can make interacting with Blast One more friction-free or l a lower friction uh, experience for the customer, then customers will order more because uh, fr friction equals cost for your customers. Um, and then the second expectation is that if we can offload activities from sales that sales will otherwise be performing, then we end up with free capacity that we can convert into additional sales activity. 
So let's start with the first one. Any, uh, do you have any evidence that customers are seeing the, a, a decrease in the friction involved with interaction, uh, interacting with Blast One? Yes, I would, I would definitely say that. And it's just from our turnaround times on our quotes, turnaround times on our follow-up, um, the team aspect, you know, whereas customers that were used to just dealing with an area manager or someone for us on the outside, yeah, uh, they're more and more comfortable with the team aspect because they understand and recognize that they get things done faster. Have you, so, have you seen them starting to talk directly to customer service rather than going to area managers? Yes. I mean, we still see it both ways. Some mm. people are just totally <laughs> trusting in their area manager. Um, but we have seen a, a few big customers that are just the guys that are ordering around the jobs that are they're totally comfortable calling in a customer service to get these things done. Um, and absolutely. Okay. And it's a matter of us training, too. We're trying to train our customers to use the system of customer service. And have any customers noticed a difference? Um, I wouldn't say that someone's told me that, but one of the one of the ways that we were looking at it is we have NPS scores, and our NPS score we just started keeping track of this year. But I mean, it was something like negative thirteen when we first started because we're getting a bank. But I think it would be safe to say that we're about thirty as a number. You understand NPS? Yeah. Yeah. So it stands promoters. for Net Promoter Score. Do you want to explain how the numbers work? Yeah. So you have you have promoters. You have passers or passives, and then you have detractors. Mm. So we send a survey out that says, you know, thanks for your business. You know, how likely would you be to refer um, last one to a friend or a colleague? A rating of mm. 1 to 10, 10 being the highest. Please put your comments below. And it goes out for each ticket that we send out um, to a customer, we send that to them. And what you do is your 9s and 10s are your promoters. Your 7s mm. um, and 8s are your Passes means that we don't know really care about them. And then your six and lower are your detractors. Um, and so you just pretty much you take your promoters and your detractors and you, you, know, you outweigh the two and it'll give you a number. Mm -hmm. So for us right now, we're sitting at 44, um, which, is a, which is a jump from about 30 from when we started. So that right there would suggest that the service level the customers are getting is climbing right now. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then the second objective is to take work off sales so that we can push more selling activity uh, into their calendars. Uh, what have you achieved there? Um, I mean, it's funny you mention this because when you and Alina were here for the kickoff uh, about a year or so ago, whenever it was, we noticed an immediate change um, from area managers and sending work into customer service. Mm. Um, and we've, we've totally made that transition. Um, so it's it's definitely giving them more selling time. Um, their utilizations are up from what Trevor Gooden, uh, who's a sales manager, would, would uh, report on. Um, it, it's working. And we've got Brian Kenimer, who has a, a full-time sales coordinator, Leah. Um, and that relationship's working very well. Um, so it's... It's all positive. Yeah, so I don't want to switch our discussion to inside sales because I want to keep the focus on what you've achieved. But, but certainly, I think people are curious what's happening in the background. So we have um, at least one, I think, about to be two sales coordinators causing field salespeople to perform a much higher volume of meaningful selling interactions. Yes, yes. So we have a sales coordinator right now. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. We have a sales coordinator that is, her whole role is to set up appointments for one of our outside guys who's more of our platinum account manager. So he's having the, you know, the CEO conversations, uh, mm. uh, the, the guys in the company, the, the, the big dollar conversations. And what she's doing is she's just setting his calendar up. Yeah. Uh, so it's her responsibility to set him up for phone calls, to set him up for um, field visits. Um, and it's working really well. Yeah, and I think we are recruiting the second one now, aren't we? Correct, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's good. And, and then, of course, the other thing we've done to drive sales activity up is to, is to start in, inside sales. Absolutely. And obviously, whenever we're talking inside sales, we're talking about a, 
probably a well definitely a much bigger increase in meaningful selling conversations or meaningful selling interactions compared to field sales and I think that um, so not only have we got one or two people but we have a, a fairly strong proof of concept too there we do um, the biggest proof of concept is is if you go back to the customer service model which I talked about before ballistics where you have people that were answering phones and booking orders and then they get a call from a customer, oh, I'm really interested in this $30,000 opportunity. Oh, and then they drop everything what they're doing and they talk to this customer. Um, but then where's the follow-up, mm -hmm. okay? That's the biggest proof of concept is that now all those calls coming into customer service go to inside sales. So there's not that lapse of time, there's not that worry of getting something done. They can spend 100% of their focus on that opportunity. Yeah. The other side is that we're working together as a team. So inside sales is working on the same customers that outside sales is. Yeah. And we're also sending out, we're almost dispatching, if you will, uh, field guys when a test needs to be done on site or something else needs to be done that can't be done over the phone. Um, we're starting to see some really good headway in that, um, some really, really good opportunities for us. Yeah. So I reckon we'll come back and shoot another one of these interviews and focus in on what sales has achieved. I think we need to live it a little while because the exciting thing you got is you guys have proof of concept, but the, the big opportunity now is to scale uh, sales. But, but the, the, the great news that, that I want to focus on and, and finish with here is that you've done what we, what we advise all of, 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 of our clients and followers um, that they have to do, and that's turn um, the customer service function into a robust team capable of coping with the level of growth that sales will ultimately drive. So I think it, it should be clear to everybody watching that you've achieved that in spades. Absolutely. Well, congratulations, Keith, and thank you for taking the time out to tell us about it. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.